Good morning, good morning, everyone. How are we doing? Well, I know I am excited because, as always, we have an amazing show over here. But I think today's is going to be a little extra special. Lori's, you know, getting her voice ready. And for those of you that this is your first time joining us, um, I would like to say good morning. My name is Sadie Uribe, and I'm the media producer for the Los Angeles Regional SBDC. The SBDC is a national program with over 1,000 locations across the country, helping to stimulate economic growth through business advising and development. We offer no-cost services to the local businesses through funding provided by the U.S. Small Business Administration, SBA, and from the California Governor's Office of Business and Economic Development. Dobiz. The Los Angeles Regional Small Business Development Center Network serves small businesses throughout Los Angeles, Santa Barbara, and Ventura counties. We offer no-cost business advising, meaning you can meet one-on-one -on -one via phone or Zoom to address your specific needs and challenges. And we also offer virtual training and amazing shows such as this to help and adapt and grow your business. So on that note, I am going to say good morning to the magical Lori today. Lori, how are you? Hello, I'm just putting in the chat to everybody that's today's our special show, Ask Me Anything. Um, so that's what we're going to do today. And I'm telling everybody, get the questions in the Q&A. Sadie's going to help me if we get a bunch. You know, I told you, I promised you guys last time we had this and everybody asked for more of it. So here I am live, Ask Me Anything. I am going to go over a few things before we get into the Ask Me Anything part of the show. So with that, the usual, I always use this as a platform to advertise what classes I have coming up, and Sadie will put that information in the chat. And can't stress enough the importance, especially the financial literacy session two and three. I always tell people what you're going to learn in there is a set of tools that is going to help you fully understand, fully understand how to financially manage your company. And this, guys, helps you to sleep better at night, okay? It helps you to sleep better at night because even if it turns out that it's an answer in these models I help you create for your company, the answer isn't what you want to hear, then you can do something about it. One of my favorite words in the whole world is choice. I love the word choice. We all have a choice every day to decide. We can change our existence within a second just by making a choice. And for me, CFO, being able to predict outcomes through a financial model is keeping choices on the table. As a turnaround special, I would come into companies and they would have not made choices. They had not created an awareness of what was going on financially within the company. So by the time I got there, they couldn't get a loan. They didn't have any cash flow. They were behind on their bills. You know, everything was a mess. And then you get backed in a corner and humans and animals were an animal too. We don't like being backed in a corner. Being backed in a corner eliminates choice. That's why having the understanding of how to create these models is so important. Remember, I had this up a couple of weeks ago, or I think it was a couple of weeks ago, um, and I thought I would just kind of have this as a preview to ask Lori anything. Remember, passion is what gets you out of bed in the morning. Profit is what buys a quart of milk, okay? It's always a great time to be an entrepreneur. It never feels great to be worried about money. And we need to base our entrepreneurial dreams on goals and actions that are based on reality. A quick statement about our upcoming shows. We got an all we got an all-star lineup coming up. So next week, Kathleen from Jack Concrete Coatings is coming on. Small company started from scratch. She's also involved in other activities that are just fascinating. And then August 21st, Sahar, which is a fellow advisor also at the PCR SBDC. She is going to talk about marketing from a psychological standpoint. She concentrates on how psychology plays into the aspects of marketing. I know this is going to be a real fascinating discussion, one that we haven't quite had on the show yet. And at the end of the month, August 28th, Fitz is coming on. He's a digital marketing specialist, but he also is a founder of a ice cream scoop company that he started during COVID, ended up closing down and is relaunching. And he learned so much along the way that he is going to come and share his expertise 
expertise and what he experienced because now that he's relaunching, he is starting out with a stronger platform, a greater understanding of what to do, what not to do, what to do in case of a situation when you are met with unforeseen forces, such as he was when he started the company. And I think his wisdom will really be invaluable to our office, our uh, audience to share. So with that, let's get going right away. So Kenny, what are the requirements for a small business loan? When you say requirements, I'm not exactly sure so I'm what you mean, but I'm going to tell you a rattled off one. And if I don't hit your question on the nail, so to speak, you let me know. When you think about small business loans, guys, companies that are less than three years old cannot even qualify for a bank loan. I know you're like, Lori, wait a minute, they get bank loans. So listen to what I'm saying. This is inside information having been a banker. So first of all, when you think about a bank getting money from a bank, the bank is the ideal place because it's the lowest interest rates that you can get. And then with, you know, being an SBA, it's even lower interest rates. However, banks lend out customer deposits. That's where the money comes from, right? So they have more government type rules on who they can lend to. So when you look at a company that's less than three years old, they can't necessarily qualify for a bank loan. And those that are over three years old still may have what's called a personal guarantee, right? So in that, one of the requirements for a bank loan is first and foremost that you have good, strong personal credit. Even if you're over three years, it's not going to be necessarily only the company. It's going to be your personal credit as well. Depending on the amount that you're borrowing, there's a term called secured and unsecured. When you think of credit cards, think of unsecured. So you didn't have to put up collateral to get a credit card, right? Those are unsecured loans. They're based on your credit score. And usually unsecured loans, this isn't like a given, they, they're all over, but usually you'll see unsecured loans capping out about 25, 35, maybe 50,000. Some people go a little bit more, but you don't see an unsecured loan at 200,000 is what I'm trying to say, okay? So when the other class is secured loans, and in that we're talking about small business loans, you usually have to put up some form of collateral if it's a certain dollar amount to have it secured, right? So this is commonly equity in the house. So when you go to get a small business loan from a bank, you have to have personal credit. You may have to have collateral that can be pledged. Um, it is a personal guarantee. It's it's a personal loan. And what it happens is you, we talked about usage of funds when they was on the show. So you identify the usage of funds in the company, but the lending capacity or the credit that is backing up the lending ability is via personal, both your credit as well as any collateral. Now, the aspect in the usage of funds where you're borrowing it on the business, this is when they have to define that the business is capable of cash flowing, making enough cash to pay back the loan. So your personal credit is substantiating the ability to borrow your business idea, your business concept, your business financials, um, your business history, that is helping them to secure the thought that, yes, this company is making enough money to cash flow to pay back the loan. And this is when they also look at the type of loan. We talked with Nate about a credit line versus a term loan. They look at the usage of funds, how is this funds going to be used within the company? And they use that to identify, should this be borrowed correctly for the usage of funds? Let me give an example. Say you're selling inventory in December. You know, you need a increase in credit or some kind of capital to buy product because your sales come around Christmas time. They want to possibly have that as a short-term credit line because they know the money earned from those sales will be in that time period and they want the due date to be when that money is earned to pay back the loan. But if you're doing a capital investment of, um, you know, plant property and equipment, as we call it, or a building, then the cash flows will come over a longer period of time. So they're trying to time the usage of funds of when the income is generated based on what the loan is funding to be able to pay the loan back. So bank loans definitely require both a personal and a business um, aspect. And once again, the personal is really the foundation that is allowing the money to be borrowed. Now, 
There are other ways of getting money other than going through a traditional bank. There is factoring where you can go through a receivables, you know, like um, your invoices to Costco or something or your POs to Costco, PO financing. And then there's other aspects of asset-based lending is what they call that. And then there are some of these other, you know, lending institutions like Nate talked about. So they may have less criteria. By defining the bank loan through a traditional bank, I kind of gave you the weighted one, the one that would require the most. Some of these other kind of lending sources do not require as much. And once again, secured and unsecured is a key thing to understand. So Kenny, hopefully I hit um, your question on that full explanation. Okay, guys, let me look at the next question. I have to read them sometimes to understand them. And so give me a little bit of silence as I do here. Oh, that's an interesting one. Anonymous. I sell unique two-piece African print head wraps at vendor event festivals. Some people approach, show interest, have their questions answered, but walk away. How do I quickly establish um, no like, and trust to increase sales at vendor events? You know, one of the things we want, and this is my opinion on this because this is more of a psychology thing, but at vendor events, we do tend to, as, you know, people attending them, we wander up and we ask questions and we identify something, not always necessarily intending to buy, like if we were to go into store to buy something and we were specifically focusing on buying that item. So the first thing is to understand that just because somebody's coming up asking questions, Questions, et cetera. It may be that they were not as interested to buy. Don't always hold that upon yourself because that tends to what we do. And if any of you have ever gone to a vendor event, you know, if you have somebody behind the table and they talk with you, you you're kind and you end up talking with them a little bit more, even though you're not interested in purchasing it at that point. Right. But what I would say is, any information that clearly states how much the product costs, this is my personal opinion once again, when they approach, because this will allow people who are really interested and kind of know, okay, this is a price point. I want, I, this is how much I pay. I want to find out more. You're talking to the customers that are definitely wanting to purchase and others are able to find the information they need because there's only one of you behind the booth at the time, right? Now, the other thing that happens is when people attend vendor events, they get overwhelmed. You know, they see so many things. So they may have came up, asked questions, was a little bit overwhelmed, didn't make a decision and walked away, but then later said, oh, I wish I would have bought that. I know if anybody have att attended any of these you know, festivals, have you ever walked away, got home and said, God, I wish I would have bought that. So I think having a way for people to get in touch with you afterwards is of utmost importance, right? So I think the way to build trust is to tell the story. So first of all, tell the story. When we buy at vendor events and we buy from vendors, the part that I love the most is when I hear, I crafted this. I, I you know, came up with this idea from here. I really love doing this because it's the personal story that you don't get when you walk into a Target and buy something or a Lord and Taylor. It doesn't matter what you say, but you get what I'm saying. It's that personal story. So connect with the personal story. Make sure the information is easily attainable. So when a crowd comes up, people can get the information to contact you later. Make sure the cards are at different places so somebody doesn't have to reach over to get a card. Um, make the cards easy and to take, not huge, so somebody doesn't have a big piece of paper like a flyer. So make information easily accessible so those people who come up and talk to you they already have the, I know I want this. I know how much it costs. That's a way of them having the data before they even speak to you and make it a way that everybody can walk away and get in touch with you later because overwhelm this does hit people when they're at those events. So those are my thoughts. Hopefully that um, helps. Okay, let's see. Your service area and relocating to Oklahoma. Oh, thank you. Anonymous. I am relocating outside of your service area from born and raised in California and relocating to Oklahoma. I'm convinced that I could achieve my federal certifications easier being closer to Indian military entities in Oklahoma. 
How per month are your financial fees to become a monthly client? Finally, I'm a healthcare accountant, retired, and your classes on managerial accounting are simply superior. Thank you. Well, here's the one thing to know, and Sadie may be able to put something in the chat if she's able to retrieve this. We have small business networks all over the country okay we talk about the la region but there is a small business um development center in oklahoma that can serve you and sadie may or may not i don't know have that at her fingertips to give that link to where you would go and find your local um, facility to help you now whether or not you'll get certifications easier near, near a military base um, or in your Indian reservation. I'm not sure, but I have to believe that, you know, in what you're thinking, I can see some of the thought process. They may want somebody that's local and you're able to meet with them. You're able to talk with them. So I would say, I can't say that that definitely will make it easier, but I can say that it would not hurt. And thank you so much for the comment about the managerial accounting. This is very dear to my heart because it feeds into this concept. I always say that I really want people to know their financials and I want them to be able to sleep better at night because they know the financials. Andrea, um, thank you. These are great tips and they make perfect sense. Thank you so much for saying that. And I know some of you guys might have put some of the questions in the chat, so I'm going to go into those. And if I miss one, because I'm scrolling and I miss some things, you guys just, you know, shout out at me, okay? Because I'm scrolling all over to find these. But I see Monica has, are there any resources to learn on how to open a nonprofit, how to run an administrator and how to write grants? Sorry for many questions. You know, that is a question with in its own um, grant writing. I've been around it just enough to be dangerous as they speak. I've never been a grant writer, but I have been around grant writing quite a bit. And I, off the top of my head, do not know like anything specific to um, direct you to, but I do know from people who I have clients I've worked with that are nonprofits, that there are several associations and organizations that focus on nonprofits and have classes, et cetera. So what I would do is I would look for those bigger associations and check out their website because I cannot recall them off the top of my head, but there's several clients that I had that had said, well, I took a grant writing class at this. I took this. So I would stay away, if you will, and I say this across the board, from the YouTube, the TikTok. I have nothing against YouTube and TikTok, but I think there's certain things you just don't get off YouTube and TikTok because nonprofits are their own animal. You know, you are a nonprofit, so therefore you have more government regulation. Grant writing is very specific. It has to follow extreme formats. So you want to go as high up the food chain to the recognized large organizations, associations that specialize in this rather than the one-off take a class on the weekend. So go as high up the food level you can in an organization or association, look at some of their classes, take some of their book, read some of their books, et cetera. And uh, there's a lot of information out there. So you definitely can find it. And how do you get loans with business EIN? EIN, um, good question, Monica. Let's make some clarification on EIN, okay? And I'm also going to take this as an opportunity to talk about DBAs as well, okay? So EIN is called the Employer Identification Number. And oh my God, is there a lot of confusion around this EIN number? And nobody explains it in a way people understand it. And it's it makes people think there's something it is and something it's not. So guys, after I'm done here, no one will ever wonder what an EIN is. You ready? Let's go. Okay. So the way I like to say it in slang is an EIN number is kind of like a social security number for a business. And when you think about a social security number for a person, when the person ceases to exist, that social security number can no longer be used. There's truth in that as well. So let's say what is an EIN and why does it exist? So first of all, EINs do not cost anything to get. They are from the IRS. You can get it on the IRS website. You want to make sure you're on irs.gov because if you Google EIN, you come up with a bunch of scammers that want to charge you to do this. If you need the link, I can't grab it right now, but you just email me and I'll get you the right link. So why does an EIN exist? Like I said, it comes through the federal government through um, the IRS. So let's think about, I'm going to say our constitution, okay? I know I'm getting political, our constitution, but we are governed by individuals individual states and individual states make their own rules, right? So think about if you guys are incorporated in California and you're an LLC, the number starts with 202. 
it's we incorporate or we have a small um, proprietorship, a small business proprietorship in the state that we are in. Right. So we're, we're the incorporations and the sole props are recognized on a state level. So if you went into Montana, it's going to have a whole nother numbering system. You go into New York, a whole nother numbering system. Well, do you think the IRS is going to accommodate all these numbering systems? Uh, no, I'm an enrolled agent certified by the IRS. They don't accommodate. I know that. And you guys know that too. So the EIN is the IRS's numbering system that's consistent. It is their numbering system. So let's say I want to be an LLC. I register my LLC at the Secretary of State in California. I get a 202 number. Now I got this number. The next step is to fill out the EIN form, which it says, what is your corporate ID number. That number is your corporate ID number that is on the Secretary of State stamp that you get on the articles of organization or incorporation, depending on what kind of corporation you are. Okay. So that's your corporate ID registration from the state. The EIN then links up. Here's your corporate ID from the state of California. IRS comes with an EIN and it binds them together. So now the IRS is not recognizing your 202 number at all. It's recognizing the EIN number. So this is why you must have an EIN number because this is what the IRS is going to recognize on your tax returns. This is what the IRS recognizes if you have payroll because payroll, remember, goes to the U.S. Treasury, right? So now the IRS is able to have this nice, long, consistent numbering system of EIN that all companies throughout the whole United States fit nicely into. Now, say you're a sole prop. You, by law, can use your social security number, but some people want to use an EIN number and some people are required by their banks to. It shouldn't be that way, but banks do it and it is what it is, right? So as a sole prop, you go once again on the IRS, same form, but you fill out that you're sole prop. So let's do the same kind of thought process. I'm a sole prop. Here's my social security number. I get the form filled out up links to my EIN. So now the IRS recognizes my sole prop, not by my social security number anymore, but by the EIN. So that's why it is very important if you're a sole prop who got an EIN, that you make sure you put that EIN, not the social security anymore, on everything, including the tax returns. Otherwise, you do a tax return for the social security, the IRS is waiting for the EIN. It's not linking it up. So that's what an EIN is, and that's how you get an EIN, and that's how it's used. Now, I said, like a social security, if you die, you can't use the social security again. This is same as an EIN. So let's first go to the corporation that has an EIN. So if the corporation is dissolved, files dissolution papers, that's how the corporation is completely dead, if you will. It's gone. It's dissolved. You do not have to dissolve, if I can use a term here, the EIN number. You have to file documents to dissolve the corporation. You have to shut down the bank account. You have to shut down everything, but you do not dissolve the EIN. Everybody says, how do I cancel the EIN? This is how it gets canceled. When you file the taxes, so say you were a corporation and you were a corporation between January and December, but you close sometime within that time period. When you file the taxes for next April, there's going to be a little box on the top of the Schedule C if you're an LLC, and it's going to say final return. Same thing if you're an S Corp, it's going to be final return. When your tax person checks that little box saying final return, that tells the IRS, don't expect any more returns. That's why if you have a corporation, you close the corporation, you've got to check that little box or tell your tax person to check that little box. Otherwise, the IRS is where is the tax return? Where is the tax return? So that is what an EIN is. That's how it's used. That's why it exists. And that's how it is no longer used in case you close down the company. While I'm on this, I'm going to talk about DBAs because DBAs are the other thing that's completely confusing to people. So DBAs are also known as fictitious name. It stands for doing business as. Most people think that a DBA is just because of a sole prop, and that is not true at all. So DBAs are for the main purpose is doing financial transactions. I'm going to get back to this in a second. In a name other than your surname, this would be my birth name if I was a sole prop, 
or the company name if I had registered the company as a name. Now, people, I had somebody ask me this this morning. Can I do brochures and flyers in another name market? Yeah, you can do that. It's when you have a financial tra transaction that's the problem. So say that I turn around and I try to put a check in Sadie's bank account. Although Sadie would be, thank you, Lori. I can't because my name is not on Sadie's bank account, right? Say somebody tries to put a check in my company's bank account, although I'd love it, but my company is business simply put. You can't put a check in my bank account. The bankers check to make sure that the name on the account matches the name that's the check is being deposited to, right? So say that I'm a sole prop and I want to call myself Lori Williams Excellent Consulting. Well, if you write the check to Lori Williams Excellent Consulting, oh, nope, that doesn't line up. It's not my surname. So I get a DBA so I can do business and do financial transactions in a name other than my surname. Now, say I have a corporation and I called it business simply put, and I want to turn around and I want to maybe start marketing under tax simply put because I want a tax separate tax um, section. Well, if somebody wrote tax simply put, oh, doesn't line up. So I, as a corporation, would get a DBA tax. Um, what did I call it? tax simply put? And that way, the check written out to tax simply put or the credit card transaction could go in my bank account. Now, just like an EIN, once you get a DBA, your full name becomes that company DBA or your name DBA. So you'll see DBA being a blank to fill in on a business license, on your tax returns. You become known as that name and you got to make sure you're consistent. So you got to be really respectful of EINs and names and corporate names and sole prop names because these all go on legal um, documents and if they don't show up consistently on the document, somebody's going to be, oh, no, that's not the company it's associated with or something along that line. OK, let's see. I'm going to stay in the chat. I see a bunch of things are here. Oh, I, I see that. Um, Nayama, I probably said it wrong. I love that the marketing ideas I like for vendor fear fairs are QR codes linked to the website. I was thinking that and I couldn't remember off the top of my head those little codes. And I like that. And she also says another idea here, consider a giveaway with info you can follow up. I like that. In items and pictures. Great ideas. Thank you guys so much for sharing in the chat. I, I love that about the chat that you guys help each other out all the time. That makes it wonderful. Uh, let's see. Oh, and I just see in the chat, we got more helping. So I don't think I'm missing any questions here. If I am, guys, just recopy it into the question box. I'm going to jump back into the question box. Oh, Sandra, thank you for the information. She's got Candid Learning, learning.candid.org as a suggestion on the nonprofit. I would like to put my wife in charge of the business and transfer everything in her name, how she could make the business as a small business woman operation and what benefit she would have if she registered the business as a woman-owned business. Thanks, if it's better to leave the business under my name, who is now disabled now, and if I need to register my business with disabled business owner, what would be the benefit of the disabled business owner? Great question. So there's a whole lot to unpack there. First of all, it's not about the name at all. It's about an ownership. Now, I don't know what type of company you have, meaning an LLC, an S Corp, a sole prop. Obviously, a sole prop is an individual, so you cannot change a percent ownership. You know, if it, with the sole prop, it would be all 100% owned by your wife. You can have a partnership, though, and that can be a 51%. But where I'm going with this is when one has the ability to apply, not get, but the ability to apply under any of these type of, you know, my small minority business, what have you, it has to do with percentage of ownership, okay? It's all about percentage of ownership. Now, the thing to understand, like with an LLC, an S Corp, and a partnership, when you change percentage of ownership, and this may not be a issue with a husband and wife, but it changes the tax because percentage of ownership also identifies through a K-1, a form what percentage of ownership is taxable so a lot of times people don't understand that there's this relationship so let me back up on this so when we look at what is included as taxable or subject to tax it's the net income let's go one level up now so let's say all the sales that go into a company for the year all the expenses of the company and subtract it that's the net income so if i had thirty dollars in sales 
$20 in expenses, I would have $10 in net income. Then $10 is what is subject to um, tax and is sh shown as gross income on personal tax returns, right? So if I had a 50 50 percent LLC, you know, multi-member LLC, one member would get a K-1 representing the $5 in this case, 50% of the 10, and another member would get a K-1 representing the $5, 50% of the 10. And those are both going on the personal tax returns. If it was a different percentage and I changed it, the person with the higher percentage is going to have be subject to more taxation. So you have to understand that just changing these percentage ownerships does change the tax structure and the tax liabilities as well. Now, it doesn't mean you can't have some kind of agreement that you pay extra because they got extra taxes. I'm not saying that cannot happen, but what I'm telling you is you just have to be conscious when you change these legal structures, there's more implications in those changes, okay? Now, I also want to talk in just general terms, and once again, I'm going to be a little bit of an outlier on what I'm going to say here. Although I am a proponent for applying for any kind of certification that can benefit a company, I am a proponent for that. I think it's extremely under important to understand that not all of these certifications will bring benefit to all types of companies. Sometimes, even if you're awarded the project, the project is not going to benefit you financially. I'll give a real live example of this without giving you specifics to respect the privacy of the company. There is an individual that has been a sole prop. They um, are applying to get awarded for a contract that involves teaching within a school university system, right? And they were real excited to have this, but it's a bid project and it will pay them a little bit less. Well, now this project also involves them having an administrator and hiring the employee and having workman's comp and all these aspects that they had not considered. So now they're having to sell their hourly rate at a lower amount and add all this expense just to be able to fulfill this contract. And although this person was in love with having this contract as she was applying with for it, I said, you know what, you really need to do the math because you may be better off not having the contract. There was a business that I was a CFO, interim CFO for seven years, if you can be an interim CFO, and they had this government contract when I came on board. And it was a pretty nice, you know, revenue government contract, but they bid and the bidding was so low that the way that the cost structure was for the company, we were losing money having this contract, right? And they were the owners of the company, you know, were so in love with this contract because they had fought to get it. They did the woman-owned business. They did all this. They were very proud of this company, you know, and this contract, right? But I told them the contract, we're losing money. We cannot compete. The other people competing, they were larger companies. They had different cost structures. They could offer these lower prices. You can't. I could not get them to stop this contract. But like I said, it was a turnaround and I came in as a CFO. So one day I walked in, I'll never forget, I walked into the company owner's office and I had a check made out for 10000 to his client and said, hey, can you sign this? And he said, why are we paying the client 10000 this month? I go, well, I figure if we do business with them, we'll lose 20. And so I figured we'll be ahead if we just don't do business and pay them 10. Now I was not planning on sending the $10,000 check, but it was a way of really getting him to wake up and understand that we are losing money on this. We are losing money on this. So I am kind of, like I said, the contrarian. I know everybody is out there going, get all these certifications. They're great. It's wonderful. And I know I'm on a government thing here saying, well, not always so, but I, I have to believe in my heart and soul that the government just being an entity, the government, and that's the case, the SBDC, is truly concerned about our clients being profitable and capable of buying a quart of milk. And they would not want anybody to take on a contract, even if it was a government contract that didn't fulfill that opportunity. So when you go into these contracts blind, you're committing to a pricing structure that may not allow you to be profitable. And where am I going to go with this? Do you want to know if it'll work? Go back to my financial literacy classes. Because as a CFO, 
I don't make any decisions emotionally. I may have emotions. I'm not saying that's not true. I am human, but I make no emotional decisions. When I'm trying to decide for a client, you know, because I'm for myself, but as well for client, should we take on this contract? Should we not? Should we hire somebody? Should we not? Are we getting returns on the marketing? I go to my models. I plug in the numbers and I let the model tell me the answer. And then I evaluate because it still takes intelligence and decision making, just like we think the internet's going to replace us. We still have to analyze the data and use our intelligence and logic to figure out what makes the most sense. But I let the model explain to me what the profit margins will be and is this worth it? Because to be honest, it's yes, it's a little bit more of a pain in the you know what to go out and market and get the clients and, and you know, people think, okay, if I get this, contract, it's a shoe in I got this money coming in, I feel safe. But if you're not making money on it, you don't feel safe. I just had another conversation with somebody yesterday that is cleaning residential homes and got an offer to from another company to be able to clean more homes. They saw it as a, oh, I'm going to have constant referrals and it's going to help me to pay my bills. And I said, yeah, but you're given a reduced rate. You'd be better off not doing it. So we really have to look at the big picture. I'll end by saying, you know, please understand that companies are holistic. It's no different than a human body. If I went into a doctor and I said, I have a stomach ache, I don't feel good, but the only thing wrong with me is my stomach. And if they went to look at me or take blood, I go, what are you taking blood for? It's only my stomach. It's just my stomach. They go, well, the body works together. Well, this is the same true of companies, guys. Your sales, your marketing, your finance, everything works together. And for a company to be healthy, it must be holistic sound and that means profitable as well and if you just focus on the sales and the marketing and you think discounts and you aren't doing it financially and calculating it you can end up very sick in your company and that's why we call the balance sheet the health card you know the score of the health the financial health of the company we literally in finance use the word financial health because it's the same thing and as i always say everything first and foremost is a financial decision it really is a financial decision nothing is a decision before finance and on, on that last note on it when you think about a company or a corporation you guys all know what I mean when I say, well, marketing gets a budget and has to fit within a budget. And then, um, you know, uh, HR gets a budget on whether or not it can hire and it has to fit within a budget. And sales department has sales quota. You, you know what I'm talking about? Well, where did those numbers come from? Those numbers came from the CFO. So the CFO sits down and does all this modeling identifies what they perceive that the revenues is going to be. They look at all of the economic conditions and they analyze what possibly could be future economic conditions. I know because I do this for companies. I've done this for years. And then you come up with your best guess. It's still a guess. We're not fortune tellers, right? But we have a best guess of what we think we need financially to meet the cost structure to have in big companies we call, you know, return to shareholders. But it's no different in a small company you're the shareholder, you need to buy a quart of milk, right? So we look at all these numbers. Then what we do is we create a budget and we give it to the marketing department, say, here's your goals, this is your budget. We create a budget, we give it to the sales and we don't care about you know, managing the sales or the marketing. That's that department's problem, okay? We're giving you the money, this is the goal, but then we get a report back on a quarterly basis if you're meeting the goals. This is then being fed back into the projection model to say, okay, I predicted this is gonna happen. I gave this budget, our are we at that number? I thought if we're not at the number, that's when a budget gets cut. Nope, nope. We got to reorganize, right? So what happens is with the CFO and with, you know, especially for me managing turnarounds, et cetera, I'm managing these numbers. I'm creating numbers based on what I perceive will happen. I'm monitoring it along the way. I'm getting input from the different departments, and then I'm changing the numbers if needed, or just saying, stay the course. That's why I call it course correction, stay the course. Now let's go in a small company. You get an idea, you're all excited, you're overwhelmed, you hire somebody, you invest in social media ads, without really looking at it. You you create a competitive price because you think you'll get the deal. You get a government contract because you think that's great. But nobody's setting the budgets for this, guys. Nobody's looking at the financial health. And who's going to do that? You. 
You guys got to be the CFO for your company. And so this is why small businesses get in trouble. They have nobody flying the plane, right? Nobody's watching the controls and flying the plane. They're just choosing this based on what they're hearing out in the market. Oh, we need to get this certification. Oh, we should do this. Oh, everybody's making money over here. You guys know, you know, what? I'm old. My mother used to say, and would you jump in the lake if everybody else was jumping in the lake and you knew as a kid you wanted to be smart and go, yes, I would. And you knew the answer is no, I wouldn't. I would analyze and research the financial health of my company before I jumped in the lake. Okay, so enough on that. That is the um, question on that. Sadie, I'm lost in the chat. Am I missing any questions? I'm totally lost in the different areas. So read out anything I need to see. Well, you know, I think we just got some, like, as you said, people helping one another. People actually, I think my favorite is like the comment from, is it Andrea? After 10 years in business, I am just capitalize discovering this i want clients that appreciate me not these people that treat small businesses like that i don't want don't know that, that but i mean i think this is like the very cool thing about the m it was an ama you know format that you know this is all of us we're all in here right i mean Lori's a small business owner i'm a small business yep. owner and you know i i the ten thousand dollar check was like such an illustration for me and the whole holistic thing like uh, right. And sometimes it's so daunting being a small business owner, but we're here. And especially on today's session, Lori is here to answer things. I know. And I love that about treaty. And I think that's so true. See, one of the things, Sadie, we don't understand is going back to choice. I told you my favorite word choice. Mm -hmm. when all business, if we got it together, we get to choose our clients. We get to choose them. I didn't understand that, you know, when I felt when I was younger and I felt more desperate, it's like you're just anybody can do business with you. You know, anybody does business with you and you just kind of beg. But as a small company, here's my point, guys. We do not need a million clients. We do not need 20% market share. People do these business plans and are like, well, it's a billion dollar industry. I'm like, you're a small business. You need maybe five or 10 clients, or maybe you need this amount in sales. You don't need these huge numbers. And that's the beautiful thing because you don't have to have this reach where you go and do business with everybody and have all these marketing. You know, get people that want to do business with you, get people who really appreciate how much you charge. I was talking about that with a client yesterday. I said, you know, what you want to do is instead of trying to lower your price and discount it, offer your product or service in such a way that people are happy and willing to pay more for it because of the quality, because of the relationship, get those companies and stay close to them. And then they will give you referrals as well. You know, Going back to where I said it's always a good time to be an entrepreneur, but I think even more so now because I could be wrong, but my perception, you guys comment in the chat on this on this one, I'm feeling like people out there are wanting to buy more from small companies. I think especially since COVID, I mean, I've always wanted to do business with small companies, but I think people are wanting to do business more and more with small companies. But at the same time, and I speak to myself, I think we don't want to be overly inconvenienced to do business with small companies, okay? We want to be able to pay them easily. We want to be able to go online and feel secure making the transaction. We want to get answers. We want to, you know, kind of, we don't necessarily feel anymore like we need to get the big company prices on everything, but we at least want to have some of the main things set up. Like I was going into a small store trying to buy, it was a hardware store and I really like to buy local, but I didn't know what I was doing. I couldn't find anybody there to help me. They were understaffed and I, you know, went in several times, but I just could not get anybody to help me. And so I ended up going to Home Depot because I could talk with them and I, I felt bad, but I didn't know what I was doing. I really needed somebody to help me. And I was kind of feeling like I was in inconvenience because they go hold on we'll be back and they couldn't help me so i think we have to structure our services so we don't inconvenience the people who are purchasing and if we do that they will be willing to pay a little bit more and it goes back to i really do feel as though it is the um, revival of the small company. I think we're finding a comfort and power in doing business amongst each other. And this is my childhood because I grew up where I always thought and I got older that I lived in the country. But now I understand I actually was podunk. I couldn't even qualify as the country, right? 
it was just farmland. And I grew up thinking like everybody had a company, you know, this person, Jack's Tires and Marie Small's Grocery Store and, you know, the farmer's. And everybody did business with each other. And that's just how it worked. And I watched these companies and they just grow little by little, like Jack's tire. He, you know, sold tires over the years. He became trusted. And when his son took over the tire company, there was another Jack's in another town, a little small town. He had, a, you know, he'd grown to the next one. And Marie's expanded and put another division on her store because the community grew a little bit more and she needed more space. And I feel as though we're losing out on the baby steps of entrepreneurship when we buy into this Hollywood. Oh, I got to expand and I'm going to be an IPO and everything. And I think that started with the digital.com. Remember, I'm 60 guys. I've been around a long time. I've seen a lot. I've been a business consultant my whole life, you know, so I've experienced all these. And I think we got this fictitious, untrue, untrue belief that these small companies need to grow and start out the gate as a legal entity and get a loan and do all that. Now, some things do have to have that to a degree, like if I'm starting a restaurant, it's a brick and mortar. I got to have a space. I got to have. But then again, do I? I could start out as a pop up and test my food products. You know, I, what I'm saying is there's so much um, availability to put your little toe in and test the water and put your toe in and test the water that there wasn't years ago. I remember when I started my first company, it was about 25. And then at 26, I moved into this like tiny little office. It had this gross orange shag carpet and this gross curtains. It was enough room for two desks. That was it. I had to have an answering service that I couldn't afford, but I had to because somebody had to be able to there to answer the phone properly. Right. And so I had all these expenses to just look like you know, be, to be in business because I had to have an answering service and stuff. And this dawned on me many years later as I was walking in a Starbucks on a cell phone talking to a client. I thought, oh my God, how far have I come from having to have this office and having a secretary when I really didn't need one for the few calls just because that was required to walking in a Starbucks working on this big CFO bank deal on my phone, get ordering, oh, hold on a second. Can I have a non-fat latte? Okay, thanks. Now on the million dollar, I mean, I was like, oh, Oh my God, things have changed so much. And now today, being able to be virtual and people accepting that, I think the possibilities are endless. And that means that we can cash flow ourselves a lot of the companies. We can test them. We can grow slowly. We can grow smart. The only thing that is causing so many people to feel they have to jump in big and overstep is the friggin' ego. Get that out. Get that out of it. Because I can't go into the grocery store and say, I need to buy a quart of milk. My company's not financially healthy, but I got a really big ego. <laughs> Can I buy a quart of milk with my ego? Egos don't buy anything. And when you get old, they kind of go away. You don't care anymore and you can kind of talk from there. But um, I think that the key is to really know that Anything in life that grows, it grows incrementally, little by little by little, and there's such pleasure in that. Now, I know anybody out there that has children can relate. You know, sometimes they grow up to be a little bit more of a pain, right? But but still, they grow incrementally. They don't become a baby and a teenager, and you don't try to force that. Businesses are the same. It's just like building a house. You you put a foundation, you put the next board, you put the next board, et cetera. And that's how you want to actually um, grow the small company. Okay, Sadie, that was a big, long uh, lecture on um, things, but- but, you know, uh, were there other questions? I, I'll go on a rage. You just say something and I'll start ranting again. I seem to do that really well. <laughs> well, you know, I think we're getting into like the life advice kind of moment. I think we were talking about that, like, you know, when we're prepping for today's session, you know, where we generally, um, like the last time we did the MMA, I mean, they were, it was all about loans and very specific, but I think now we're veering into the like, I would say the emotional, spiritual, mental health side of being an entrepreneur, because it's ego I mean isn't that always something that I think it's more of like a revolutionary thing where we're not we discuss this now versus like well what's your profits like you know what a, how do we perform as an entrepreneur or a small business owner like how do we manage our personal and then this is like your livelihood it's all you no one else 
It is. And I can see in the chat that I definitely hit on something that people want to talk about. You know, I, I'll go back and I'll tell you a story. And, and this is so long ago, but it's so dear to my heart. I remember it so well. You know, like I said, I, I started my company at 25. And I had at that time, I, like I've told you guys, I wasn't the finance person from the beginning. I was the warm, fuzzy salesperson. That's what I was. I was sales marketing. And I was working for companies and they had situations where this company f suddenly shut down unexpectedly. This happened. And um, I was working with this one and it shut down. And I said, you know, that's it. I just want to start my own. And I started more out of desperation than inspiration. Definitely was more out of desperation. And I started the small business offering Macintosh, um, basically desktop publishing when the Mac first came out. Remember, I'm old. I've been around a long time, right? So I, I ended up coming up with enough money through friends, family, and fools to buy a Macintosh. I hired one of my friends that was a desktop um, that did the Mac. They had been in the old Linotronic 202 systems and they did the Mac and then we you know, had a company, right? So I started doing um, overflow for the advertising agencies and eventually got to the point where we were an advertising agency. But it really wore me out. I was, you know, I had the company for about five years. And what happened is my original friend, my friend that I had hired, he got unexpectedly sick. He ended up okay, but it was questionable. He got Gillian Beret and he was in the hospital and overnight he handled everything. I did the sales and marketing. I couldn't even access him. And I was about 28 then. And I had a house and a mortgage and I was scared to death, scared to death, just cried and cried and cried. But I kind of picked myself up and I kept going. I got another employee. But, you know, after about three years, I was really burned out. I went, I was in Texas at the time and I went to California to my sisters to just kind of go away for a weekend. And what was really interesting is I was on the beach and I thought, oh my God, if I didn't have the company in the house, I would just start over and I would do this. And this idea came in my mind. And when I got back, everything just kind of mysteriously fell in place. It's like the universe was helping to direct me. I had my friend say, oh, by the way, people want to really rent out houses on this. I had somebody knock on my office door from the office and ask if they could have a client look at my space because they wanted to get another space and theirs wasn't finished yet in my office building. And I said, sure. And I said, yeah. And if you want to buy anything in here, you know, I, I'd like to leave. And they go, yeah, we'd love all the furniture. I was like, okay, that, this happened like within a week. I went down to the office to see about my lease. They go, we don't have a lease on file. I don't know why we didn't have you re-sign a new one. So suddenly I started thinking, well, maybe something is to this, right? Well, it was within a short period of time that I just felt like I needed to start over. And I decided, you know what? This is good timing. I'm going to lease out the house. I am going to shut down the company. I'm going to go to California. I'm going to get a job for a little bit and I'm going to start again. And I was 31. I remember this expression, you can't bend on at 31. I felt like I had no choice. I was like, you got a house, you got this, you can't move. I'm like, no, you can't bend on at 31, right? So this is my emotional. This is what I want to tell you. So here I am in the heat of Texas, sitting in my garage, trying to sell in a flea, you know, in a garage sale, I mean, all the belongings from the office. I'm sitting there in the heat, sweating to death, waiting for somebody to pull up to buy the staple guns and the office supplies because I had employees, all this stuff. And I sat there one day and I wanted to get to this. And this is what I wanted to tell you. I sat there one day in my garage and I said, isn't it ironic? Every single day of my existence in this company, I woke up and I went to bed scared to death that I would fail because if the company failed, I failed. And that meant I was a failure. That's all I thought about every single day. And here I am in the end, shutting the company down. And then I thought to myself, what if during that entire time, I didn't have that emotion? What events would I have went to? <clears throat> Where would I have given people more time? How would I have been kinder to myself? And at that point in time, there was a index card and a pen sitting there. I'm not making this up, guys. True story. Index card sitting there in my garage for sale. I took the index card and I wrote on it, I will never, um, reg I will never regret the past or fear the future. I will live in the present moment. 
And three days later, when everything was sold, or a week later, I can't remember, I taped it on my steering wheel, put my two cats in the car, the movers had come, and I drove to California. And I kind of recreated the whole scene. It took me another decade to come to that understanding that whatever we do is what we do. It's not who we are. And if we approach business like we got to buy a quart of milk, but we take it as fun and we don't personalize it. And it's so friggin' silly to personalize it because we have very little control over what happens to our company. A competitor could come in, our sales could increase, something could change, um, COVID could shut us down. So we're connecting ourselves as success or failure to something that has so many chances of not succeeding. It's just, it's, it's crazy. Okay. It's crazy. Yet so many people are so afraid that if their company fails, they fail. Like I've said to you joking before, people will leave a marriage faster than shutting down a sick company. I'll, they'll be like, well, I, it, I was my baby. I started, I'm like, no, you want to buy a quart of milk. You got it in you start another company. So I think we need to have a healthy arm's length from our companies. We've got to be able to dream and experience. And we have to understand that it's these hands, these brains, these bodies, this creativity. That's the company, not what you're selling or what you're doing. Okay. And you can recreate it and you can change and you can adapt to new situations. And I ended up going back and getting a job that got me so interested in finance that I ended up going back to school, getting all my degrees. And I did start my company again, a good maybe four or five years later, and I was completely finance. So there's how the story came about and why I have this marketing background and I am involved in finance. And since then, what I really have learned and I live by this now is Life can be one of two ways. It can be a drudgery. I've lived it as that. I've done very well at that. And I try never to go there again. Or it can be a fascinating adventure. But I also know that if your bills aren't met or you're worried about money, it's hard to make it a fascinating adventure. That's why you have to make sure whatever you go at, you don't go at just for passion and excitement. It has a sound financial base that you can pay your bills because that's an important aspect of it. And then beyond that, you can create anything and things can change on a dime. And there's just so much opportunity out there, especially today, because the companies can be created in such different ways. So I think that success as an entrepreneur is a combination of intellect, you know, understanding, you know, combination of wisdom, looking at what is true and what is not reality, and then a combination of taking action. And risk is not about just blindly doing anything. Risk is about understanding what you're up against, looking at what the situation is, choosing the worst thing that can happen, and then going for it. I also mentioned to you guys that up to about a year and a half ago, I was a pretty intense um, rock climber. I did traditional rock climbing. Anybody that knows anything about rock climbing, I did trad. And I was leading um, up to 11s, which is pretty friggin' intense. And I was also known by many as a huge risk taker because I would do some free soloing. But I never saw it as risk. I saw it as the fact that I assessed the situation. I assessed my skills. And I would always say, trust in yourself and trust in your, your equipment. You know, we always say, trust in the gear, trust in ourselves, right? And then what I would do is I would assess all the possible things that could go wrong to see if I had a uh, backup plan. And then at the end, I would say to myself, if you do this, you could die. Are you willing to accept this risk? How do you feel this risk is weighted? And I go, yes, I am willing to accept this risk. But I usually then said, then I'm going to climb really high. So if I fall, I die and I'm not maimed because I didn't want to be maimed, right? So I was like, if I go, I'm going to go big, right? But my point is, I think there's something that carries over into the story of being in business. I didn't just say, oh my God, this is so exciting. I'll just go and get passion and start jumping on this climb. I really studied. I understood. I knew what I was capable of. I knew what I was not capable. Of, of, but I also knew that there was a certain level of risk involved and I assessed the worst outcome and then I accepted it because once I accepted it, I could go full force and I knew if I was wavering at all in my mind, I would fall off the rock.
There's something that's so amazing about it. If you're wavering and unsure, you fall. <laughs> it's it's like it taught me that if you're not convinced and you're not confident, you won't succeed. And I think that's true in business as well. Okay, guys, did that make any sense or did I just ramble on for you? Uh, uh, you no, no, everyone loved it. <laughs> everyone loved it. I'm, I'm not even a kid because like, you know, I, I'm all about like reading people, right? Like nonverbal cues. And honestly, when you did like, you were reliving it in your brain. And when you did the thing of like, I left Texas and I drove out to California, like you literally got a twinkle of happiness in your eye, reliving that memory where you're like, I'm off to my next adventure. Yeah. And now I've been, uh, you know, I've been having adventure. So uh, I'll end it with one last thing. So the story didn't quit there. I'll, I'll end it with this last uh, minute. And I know there's going to be questions about this. So nine years ago, once again, in my Lori style, right? I'm sitting in the apartment in California and I told you I was co-podunk country and I also a rock climber. So I really love nature. And I was like, you know, California was fun. It was a great adventure. I went to, you know, Pepperdine. I taught at USC. It was awesome. But, you know, I really need to move someplace else. And I couldn't pick a place. I was like, I don't want to be there in the winter. I don't want to be there in the summer. So I got this big, huge, bodacious idea 10 years ago before it was cool to pay to have a complete van created into a tiny home and take my Jeep and go on the road. And so for eight and a half years now, I've been living on the road. Every time you hear me on the with the background, I'm in another state in another place. Um, so I got to combine my professional life and my personal gypsy life together. So I'm ending with this, guys. When I say to you, anything is possible. When I say to you, dream with a sense of reality. When I say that you can create and you can have your financial freedom, I am not just saying it, guys. I'm not just one of those people that stand up and talk and lecture it. I did it. I'm living it. I'm telling you from my personal experience. And when I say to you that I'm trying to teach everybody finance and bring them you know, small business training so they can live it too, I'm not kidding. I really am. So that's the real Lori. You joined in today. You got to hear the story. I may never tell it again, but you got to hear the story. So that's that's where I'm at. So any last questions or comments? I know we're a minute after, but it's only Sadie and I. We can break the rules, right, Sadie? That's right. I, I think we do that on the reg. So that's not surprising, right? We do it I, all the time. But I know. So any last, I'll give you guys a couple minutes of any last questions and say, Sadie, I'll, you know, have you in the meantime, you know, cl close us down here. <laughs> um, you know, I think like, but th that was the cool thing because we did the AMA, a I, I always like say that too fast. AMA, like, um, was ask, it a month ago? Yeah, ask me anything. I love that. <laughs> you, you, yeah. you, that. you get the AMA award. Ask hey, me hey. anything. Yeah. Well, I'd like to thank Lori for this moment. I'd like to thank the SBDC for this moment. But I, I like I said, you know, we're here to help. And like, this is, we always find ways to help people. I think that's what's so amazing about the SBDC. I mean, like, I, I love Lori, you know, Lori's one of our, you know, most awesome advisors, but I think like that's the, the thing as an entrepreneur, it's like we're our own community. So we have to help one another. This is why the chat is always blowing up people giving suggestions, advice, this and that, because, you know, we inspire and motivate one another because like, right. When, when someone's having a bad day, you listen to someone else. And it's like, what, are, what do athletes always say? You don't see the like 1 million times they failed the shot. You just see the story about the one time they got that one basket and like, that's all people think about, but it's like, you don't see all the stuff in the background. So I, I think that's why this show is such a success is because we have built this community and this is what we do. We all support one another and we help one another. And I think that's why it's so special. And now I feel the little tears in the corner happening where I'm like, oh, it's a wonderful place to be. <laughs> I do. I love that. And and Andre, yes, you can put your personal information to share it with others. I just don't like people doing a marketing because I like the chat to be pure and sharing. But by all means, if you want other people to be able to touch out to you, feel free to do that. And you know, Sadie, it's true about the show. When my vision for the show, guys, and I've talked about this before, but some of you may not heard this. I hated those Hollywood sh shows where people would come in and they were entrepreneur and they go, I started out and I suffered and I did this. And you were like feeling it and you're 
you're really relating, they go, now I drive a Ferrari and you want to go, you, you know why, you know, and it makes <laughs> you sad, right? but you don't even know their story. And I hated those. And I said, real people, real talks, real discussions. I just, I'm about reality. I really am. I'm not, I'm not anything Hollywoodish. So I wanted this show to be talking about what it's like, what, it, how fun it is, how it, the adventure is and how grueling and challenging it can be as well. And I do believe that is what makes this show so popular, which I'm always amazed at how popular it is. And it's because we're talking about things that people relate to. So with that, Sadie, um, you know what? We're going to close it down. We'll have another Ask Lori Anything down the road. I promise I'll come back for another one. But um, thank you for today and listening. I never have told this story live. And I decided you know, when Sadie asked me that, I am going to give you the whole real Lori. So now every time you click in, you're going to know more about who I am and where I'm coming from. So Sadie, thank you. Thank you out to everybody who's been there. Thank you all the comments. I see Sandra. Thank you so much. I see all the wonderful Chris. I, like I said, I might be missing your names because these to fly by and I don't see it. I see Randy's out there. I feel like, you know what, Sadie, I feel like romper room now. I see <laughs> You, know, you got to be old enough to know romper room, right? I'm feel, I just thought to myself, oh my God, I'm like romper room right now. <laughs> Too funny. Okay, got to go, everybody. See you next week for Small Biz Talk with your host, Lori Williams. Sadie will stay around for a little bit as well to catch up on your comments and get my information out there if anybody wants to reach me directly. And I will see you next week. Thank you, everybody. Bye. Bye.